What is up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Talk To Me here on NotFest.com. As always, I am Joshua Toomey, joined by the one and only Chris Aiken. Chris, how are we doing? Peachy, man. How about you? <laughs> I'm doing well, man. What's the uh, well, give us an arm update? Still attached. <laughs> <laughs> have you have you tried to like start gnawing it off at any point yet? Dude, I am just ready to take a fucking hatchet and just cut this motherfucker off. I mean, it is killing me. I don't know. It, you know, and it's weird because it, it it started feeling like it was getting better, and maybe I pushed it too much. I probably did by doing two hours of CMS on um last Saturday, and then I did the straight two hours straight of Chris Aiken presents on Monday. Wow. And I don't feel I don't I didn't feel anything yesterday, but boy, today, whew, I feel like somebody. <laughs> you you ever you ever when you were a kid you ever play like tug of war. And, and like you were in the middle and you'd have your arms out like this. And like one guy would be on one side, the other be on the other pulling like on, on like on, on you. you. Yeah. Oh, no, I don't yeah, I don't like you I would try, and you would try to pull him, pull the oh, okay. both sides yeah, in the middle saying. type of a deal. I feel like that, but one side has like a really strong guy. <laughs> 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 That's what my arm feels. It just feels like somebody's trying to pull it off of my fucking body just brutal well you don't need to be watching that 127 hours movie or whatever it's called where where he you know he gets his arm pinned and then he cuts it off and all that stuff so you might get some ideas on how to cut yeah. your own arm off <laughs> might come back next week with a whole different story to tell <laughs> <laughs> one-armed chris aiken That's right uh, <laughs> Well, man, we both did some interviews this week. Let's dive into yours first, man. Mickey D, that's a that's a good get, man. That's, yeah, that's man. an awesome interview. Yeah, Mickey was Mickey was good. I wish, I wish I wouldn't have had that damn popping bullshit that happens every once in a while with the with the stream yard. Yeah. But other than I mean, he was dropping bombs, which was great. You know, he definitely he didn't hide, he didn't hide from anything. Uh, you know, he he really hammered the people that hammer motorhead for continuing to release release product now <laughs> yeah that was great he was like i mean you know a lot of these guys they'll they'll kind of reference the trolls on blabbermouth or whatever but they won't really come all the way out and say it mickey d was like if you're trolling me on blabbermouth fuck you don't listen <laughs> <laughs> i mean just that blunt he, he was like fuck you don't listen anymore I was like damn <laughs> <laughs> well, well yeah. motorhead's one of those bands that they you know, they, they are a brand and they, they mm -hmm. will continue to release things and you sure. know, statues and comic books. And, you know, I'm sure there, there'll be stuff forever from motorhead. I think so. It, it, it was just, to me, it was interesting that he took such offense to fans or non fans. Really. It's more to the point to non fans Yeah, being non fans. I was just like, dude, who gives a shit? You know, they're just fucking <laughs> blips on your screen, but you know, he just he just was really offended by that, and he took an absolute hard pop at those people, which was funny to me. But he talked about a lot of shit, too. He talked about transitioning from Motorhead to Scorpions and, you know, how that was a difficult drumming transition for him. And, um, you know, it talked about, you know, I asked him about the Lemmy bullets, and he didn't, he, I, I'm guessing he didn't get one. Because when I asked him about the Lemmy bullets, he's like, I don't know anything about that. I was like, oh, okay. That's, yeah, that's strange because, I mean, you know, Ricky Rackman got one of those bullets. And yeah. I think if uh, if Ricky gets one, you know, Mickey D most likely got one. Maybe it's lost in the mail or something. Maybe. Well, I mean, that's a long lost. Did you uh, did you happen to ask him about having to go on after Pantera at the, uh, at the live show? I did not ask him that. I probably should have. I just kind of. I don't know. He was on a roll, man. It, it, I didn't have a whole lot of a whole lot of asking to do. He just was like, bah, 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 I was like, okay, cool. Keep going, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and you did that at like what 6 a.m. So that's yeah, crazy. that was another thing too. Was he was in um Sweden or somewhere, Stockholm. Yeah. And um and the only times are available, I guess, I guess like two or three of us did them. It was myself and the metal voice and, and one other guy, I think did them, but the only times that were available were between four 30 AM and 6 AM Eastern time. <laughs> wow. 
Yeah, I did. Uh, I recently interviewed Johannes from Avatar, but it was like 11 a.m. on a Sunday, so it wasn't too bad. Yeah, this was thankfully I never sleep, so I, right. it, it really wasn't that bad of a deal for me. But I will admit, I was a touch groggy <laughs> coming into it. I was like, ooh, you know, that that coming in straight from bed to the lighting that was that was just such a you know, you're 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 in a bed and you're warm and it's dark and then you <laughs> wander in here and you got lights all over the place before you've even had a cup of coffee. It's like, Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Cause you, if I was to do that, do that interview, I would have gotten up at like five, you know, showered coffee, all that stuff before the interview. <laughs> like that had to be, that's, that's a tough one, man. It showered the night before. And I quite literally set the alarm for five minutes before I had to be in here. And I, I just rolled out of bed, came straight in here. I had the, the screens and everything all set up with the, you know, the, the bullet points and stuff so that yeah. I didn't end video and everything ready to go and just in. That was it. <laughs> came in, turned on the computer, boop, Mickey D popped up. <laughs> I was right into it within five minutes of waking up. Wow. <laughs> Well, man, speaking of interviews I did on Sunday, uh, one that's already out was my interview with Burton C. Bell. Yeah, look at you making the news everywhere. Every Yeah, my uh, Google alert came through and it was just like blabbermouth, uh, metal sucks, metal injection. <laughs> you know, like it just went on revolver magazine. Sure. Like everybody picked it up, man. Um, I, that was a fun interview because of it. I, obviously it was for his upcoming, you know, uh, photography exhibit. Mm -hmm. ha, you know, but it had to sneak in a couple of fear factory questions. And obviously those took off. And, uh, I, I looked at it today of the not fest era. This episode, I think is the sixth most downloaded episode now. So, okay. Very cool. So good, good job, Burton. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I listened to it. I mean, he's, he's doing the polite dodge. I, yeah. I, I'm going to say this. I say it all the time. I wish these guys would just be honest, not just Burton. And I, and I don't know he's being dishonest. I'm, I'm making an assumption that he's being dishonest, but all of these guys, the Rob Halfords of the world that I never listened to the Ripper albums ever. Yes, you did. Yeah. Yes, you did. And, and same with Burton Burton saying, I, I have no interest in it now. Yes, you do. <laughs> you spent 35 years creating it. Yet you, you have interest in it. And, and let's face it. Any of us, any of us in our real life, if somebody takes our job and we can see what they're doing, we're going to take a peek. Right. We're going to take a peek oh, and see what they're doing. Well, I mean, you know, I, I was in primer 55 for a little bit and there were bass players after me. And yeah. I, I would be lying if I didn't, you know, watch a few YouTube videos to see how they were doing and things like that. And there was even a, a 12 volt negative earth album after I left. I, and uh, I helped write some of the songs on it. So I listened to it. And, you know, I was like, oh, I wrote that part a little bit different right there. But, you know, I would have played a little bit different right there. Things like mm -hmm. that. So, so I mean, yeah, you do. I I highly doubt he hasn't at least, you know, looked at one YouTube clip of or something like that. Has. Like he's <laughs> he's given a little peek. You have to. You have to. And even if you just look at it to go, oh, yeah, that guy fucking sucks. He's nowhere near <laughs> right. as good as me. Even right. to put that into your own head. You know, or to put it into your head of, all right, that guy's not bad. Now I get, you know, you know now I'll get some extra royalty checks because this guy's doing my job. Cool. You know, I, I mean, there, there's, there's something to it. There's no way, especially with all the hype that's been on the Fear Factory singer thing. Yeah. There's no way that the actual Fear Factory singer is like, oh, no, I'm so busy and I'm oblivious to it. You know, that, that's not just not true. Can't oh, be true. I will say he doesn't he doesn't have much of an online presence. Like if you go to his Instagram or his, mm -hmm. his Facebook page and things like that, like he doesn't really post very often. So I mean I don't know how much of a social media online person he is to to really know that you know blabbermouth is posting about uh you know Please. Uh, fear factory almost every day, things like that. You have his phone number in your phone, right? I do. Which means that every other friend of his has his phone number in in their phone. Which means that every look, different different category completely. I'm not going to say who the person is, but okay. I I'll tell you after. There's a celebrity that I'm friends with that is Ooh. very very much in the news and will be in the news for the next week. Okay. And um, I texted him today, 
uh, there was a big announcement about what he's involved in. And, and I texted him today and I was like, Hey, what the fuck? You know, where are you at with this? And he was like, Hey, you know, I'm sort of not involved in this, you know, and I'm, I'm being left behind type of a thing. You know, now I know okay. I did that for my friend that is in the business. I guarantee you Burton has the same exact thing going on in his text. Fear Factory announces new singer Milo Silvestro, unknown guy from Italy. I guarantee you Burton's had a couple of texts that have been like, hey, man, ever heard of this guy? Right. This guy's stealing your gig, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. you know. And then there'll be a couple of friends that even though the guy's good, will say that he sucks. There'll be a couple of those. This guy can't fucking hold a candle to you, man. You're going to be missed. You know, all that kind of shit too. Guarantee you he picked up his phone or looked on his laptop or something to say, let me see what, let me see what this guy did in Phoenix yesterday. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't put it past him, man. Uh, we'll read from the blabbermouth story here. In a new okay. interview with Joshua Toomey of the Talk To Me Ooh. podcast, heard heard of that guy, and I got a name drop on blabbermouth. I always, Look at that. always like that. Uh, Ex-Fear Factory singer Burton Seabell was asked how it felt to see his former group going out on tour with someone else singing the parts he originally wrote and recorded with the band. Now, that's, that's a good question right there. That's a great question. Uh, it doesn't affect me at all. To be honest, I haven't been this happy in a long time, more power to them, but I'm just moving forward in my life, my own career. And I'm just trying to make a name for myself. Okay. Go ahead. No, I was going to say that's to that point fair. Cause he really didn't say he didn't look. He just kind of yeah. says, Hey, good for them. And Brian means good for them because if replica gets played again, a bunch of times on Spotify, he'll get a, you know, Another $3 check or something in the mail. Um, asked if he had checked out any of the videos on YouTube of Fear Factory performing with his replacement. They're, uh, the Italian-born singer Milo Silvestro. Bell said, no, I don't, and I don't care to. <laughs> yeah, see, I just don't. I, I and Again, I could be wrong on this. I just never believe anybody that says that stuff. I don't believe... I don't believe Jason Newstead doesn't check out what Metallica is doing. I don't yeah. believe that Rob Halford didn't check out the stuff that Tim Ripper Owens was doing. I, I don't believe any of the 15 singers that Ingve Malmsteen has had. Don't look to see what the next guy's doing or Michael Schenker or, you know, whatever. It, pick a, pick a guy. You know, I, I don't believe Alex Van Halen doesn't look to see what Sammy and, and Michael Anthony are doing every once in a while. I just don't believe that you could have, that have a long-term relationship that's creative where part of the part, you know, I believe it. If you're a plumber, you know, if you're a plumber, you don't follow around to the, to the guy, Hey, how'd that guy do with your toilet? You know, I don't, I don't <laughs> right. think, th I don't think you do that, but when you're in the creative arts and everything is based on fan reaction and interaction, and let's play and let's be honest, every single band ends up with, this is the favorite guy. This is the not favorite guy. And you were in bands. You can speak on this more than me. You know, there is some of that. Hey, why is this guy getting more attention than me? That goes on in every band in every, not just a band you were in. I'm saying in every band, there is some of that. So with that said, then all of a sudden, well, I'm not in the band no, anymore. And even after 35 years of creating it, I don't care. Bullshit. I just don't believe it. Yeah, he does go on to say, uh, went on to say that he doesn't mind being asked about Fear Factory, despite the fact he is no longer in the band. Fear Factory, it's what I'm known for, he explained. In 30 years I had in Fear Factory were some of the proudest moments of my career. And everything I've done in Fear Factory, I'm very proud of. Even some of the questionable things I've done in Fear Factory, I'm still proud of. It was a great legacy. Yeah, he's not wrong there. It is a great legacy. Yeah. All the more reason he'd want to see how it's going to play out. <laughs> are you tarnishing my legacy out there yeah you know? but but it, you know there's there's probably legalities and everything to that too i'm assuming some some sort of legalities that you can't just go out and trash it you know and say oh this guy's fucking he took my record and that wasn't supposed to come out and he put it out and now he brought a new guy in to sing it and you know there's probably something to the well you got paid by nuclear blast so don't trash the record don't trash the tour Maybe. I don't know. I, again, I'm talking on my ass. 
<laughs> well, like most weeks. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> I, I read a few comments under under some of the things, and people are like, "Why is he whining about this?" I was like, "He didn't. He didn't whine at all about anything about Fear no. Factory." And and like I, I read another one, like the media needs to give it a rest. I'm like, it's not. You can't give it a rest. It just happened. Wait a minute. Yeah, give it a rest. It happened last week. <laughs> and this was like I I I guess this is one of Burton's first interviews you know since all of this has happened so mm -hmm. you know obviously if i didn't ask everybody be like why didn't you ask him about it yeah <laughs> yeah i you mean it, it's it's not asking ace freely if he's going to get back with kiss you know i, I mean that's 30 years yeah. later it's it's a week it's been one <laughs> they played their first gig what last sunday or something yeah so <laughs> it's been one week and you asked the question that's not that's not you know stretching too far so but yeah i think uh i i know he was but like I, I did text with him a little bit after kind of all the stuff started going viral mm -hmm. and it's kind of funny kind of talk because most times we don't talk one-on-one -on -one with you know me band members after sure, sure, sure. things we you know things that we do go viral mm -hmm. through our you know, respective podcasts or whatever but he was bummed that people were picking up on only the fear factory part of it. And I was like, well, you know, that's going to get a lot more people on, you know, looking at the actual episode and looking yeah. at the, you know, at the, at your, your photo exhibit and things like that. So I think, and, and it was definitely all positive. I thought so, you know, uh, you know, just gratefully came on the show. Grateful to kind of yeah. have that, that. That's a huge number to have in my phone. I mean, that's like, that's, that's one of those, you know, 18, 20 year old me would freak out if I could just text Burton C. Bell, you know? Right. Exactly. And, and it will get him more attention toward his photography. And, you know, the interesting thing though, and, and, and I think artists forget this a lot when they, when they go on to another project or whatever, especially if it's not the same, you know, if he's doing another metal, if he was doing another metal band, he'd probably be thrilled about this because yeah. then people would be listening to the music. You know, I'd imagine if he had a new Ascension of the Watchers record getting ready yeah. to come out, he had a single out there, he would be doing great numbers because of that interview. Art's a little bit different. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a different career. It's a different medium. And let's face it. I mean, what's your favorite painting? Can you even name one? Ooh, uh, favorite painting. Yeah, I don't have <laughs> that, a favorite that's painting. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. It's a, it's a totally different medium to where fans of this medium heavy metal music we're really not invested very much in it yeah so burton c bell while that means a lot to metalheads because of fear factory that don't mean shit to anybody that's into art so at least this is keeping his name out there and bringing the you know the onesie twosie fans that are into both over so i think he needs to not worry so much again no, talking out my ass but whatever <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think he, uh, I think he had a good time, you know, as long as good chatting with him and, and sure. all that good stuff. So, and I'm excited. He talked about doing that, uh, that Rammstein, you know, uh, tribute album on Cleopatra. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as he said that, man, I just kind of laughed because Cleopatra is just known for, uh, you know, former members of kiss and it's right. you know, Bob Kulik. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like yeah. It's, it's like nobody. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I think it'll be fun, man. I, I'm I'm curious to see what they do with a Rammstein covers album and uh, or tribute album with uh, with with Burton singing in uh, German. German, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, now isn't it weird though? All the all the German guys they do sing in American in English, not American, but English. Yeah, that's going to be really interesting to see how many of these American artists can learn enough German to sing. Like, you know, we all know Du Host as a song, right? Yeah. Can you can you name like two lyrics other than Du Host? Uh Du Host. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's yeah. it. It's it's like none of us even took the time. We're so lazy as Americans, we're not gonna learn the humney sumni honey ka. You know, we're gonna we're not learning any of that. We just wait till the chorus and go, Du Host. Yeah, I I when they very, very first came out, I went through a little phase of like translating, but I mean, that was like real, real early internet. I don't even know. I don't even know if I had a book, if I was doing it on the line or with a book, you know? Right. I mean, that was pre Google and all that stuff. So I don't know sure. if I was, but I do, I do remember 
I had a foreign exchange student friend uh, that I, I that he, when he moved back to Germany, I called him. I'm like, do you know about this Ben Romstein? He's like, oh, they're huge here. <laughs> and I was like, asking him about lyrics and things like that. So, but yeah, so I, I did I did take a, a few minutes to try to learn some German and see what they were talking about, but well, not too more much. Po- more power to you. I know Du Hast, Du Hast. <laughs> that's the, that is all the Ramstein lyrics that I know. Yeah, no, they're. Fun band, great band. I love them. Uh, I've seen them a couple of times. They're awesome live. They're, yeah, they're think, probably as good as anybody live. Oh, yeah. If you want to see a fun show, you definitely yeah. can see them live. But and the, the latest the latest tour that they showed, you know, with just massive over the top yeah. fire and, and just stage presence is just gigantic. Yeah, it's as big as like Metallica does. If not bigger, so was, it might be I was bigger. Say it might be bigger. Yeah, it's huge. Uh, so, well, speaking of a band that's going to go on tour with Pantera yes. or uh, Metallica, as, as I ruined that one. <laughs> speaking of again. a band that's going to go on tour with Metallica, and that there is Pantera. Yes. And uh, from Metal Injection, the headline is Kitty's Morgan Lander has a very rational opinion on modern Pantera. Okay. She says, I'm not Team Phil and Rex or Team Diamond Vinny. Okay. Uh, there has been many opinions about Pantera's current lineup of Phil and Sumo and Rex Brown being joined by Anthrax drummer Charlie Benante and Black Label Society's uh, guitarist Zach Wild. Some people are vehemently against the whole thing, while o- others are all for it. Kitty guitarist vocal and vocalist Morgan Lander seems to err on the side of being a good thing, but also acknowledges that it isn't the Pantera of yesteryear for obvious reasons. All right. Fair enough. (laughs) (laughs) In an interview with the Audio Inc. radio show hosted by Ann Erickson, uh, Lander says she feels the soul of the band is gone now that both Dimebag and Vinny Vall have passed on. Though for younger generation that never got to experience a Pantera live show, this is the closest you'll ever get, and that's still a good thing, which is what these shows are all about, right? giving a new generation the option to throw down to classics like walk and have some fun. All right. She's not wrong. Uh, when I heard about it, I wasn't, I don't know. I wasn't mad about it. I feel like it's weird because I feel like the heart and soul of the band were the Abbott brothers and everything about their playing. Not like I could ever compare myself to any of them, but I understand what it's like to have a sibling in a band and you play together for so long that you like connect on a different level when they played, they had a certain swagger and they connected on a certain level together. And that's just something that comes with the time and practice and all of those things, but also that bond of being a sibling. And I know they were very close, obviously. All right. (laughs) (laughs) That's about as milk toast an answer as there is. Yeah, it's cool. But at the same time, it's not whatever. It's good. Take us on tour, please. <laughs> um, I was very excited to see it. We played the very first show that they were doing the reunion thing at the Heaven and Hell Festival in December, but we weren't able to get to the venue in time to see the show, so I actually didn't get to see it myself with my own eyes, but I was very excited to see it. It's weird to what? me. Be- <laughs> yeah. That, that- she. I guess she was excited to see it, but she didn't see that it see was it. happening, but she wasn't yeah. able to see the show, I guess. All right. Yeah. To me, it feels like the soul of the band is gone, but there's a lot of people that never got to see Pantera. And I'm sure that the shows are great. And with time, they'll even get better. Uh, they're doing a ton of stuff this year. I definitely want to see the set to see them play, even if it's just to hear some of my favorite tunes. No, yeah, fair enough. I'm with her. So, I, yeah. I'm with her on that. You know, it's like, why get upset about it? It's, you know, it's the only chat you got to hear to hear these songs these days, you know, by, by at least some of the guys that did the music. Dude, it's so crazy with this Pantera thing. Now, I, I, have you gone through like a complete resurgence of your Pantera fandom because oh, of this? I know I have. Uh, I don't know if my, my fandom ever really wanes. <laughs> well, it, uh, not wanes, but I, yeah. just listening more and going back to YouTube and finding more and more shows. and Like like today, as an example, okay. and I had not listened to this in years, but today I kind of watched some of the Rebel Meets Rebel stuff that's out there. Okay. And I was like, man, how did I? And I didn't like that project. I'm going to be honest. When it yeah, came I out, like I either. really didn't like it. 
But I was listening to that song, um, man, you got nothing, you got nothing to lose. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. and I just watched it today and I was like, okay, this video was kind of fun, which I never gave any time to. But Dimebag's guitar riffs are just ridiculous on that song. Yeah. And just watching him running around with David Allen Coe and still doing the jumps off the monitors and stuff and, you know, just being a silly ass that Dimebag was. I, I just was like, man, I miss that. I'm glad I'm going to see something related to that here in a few months. You know, I can't wait. I was like the story of Dimebag meeting David Allen Coe for the first time. And like he Dime actually waited in line at like a meet and greet to meet David Allen code. And when he finally got up to meet him, David goes, you're somebody like, I, you know, he could just tell yeah. the dime bag was like somebody. And, and he's like, Oh, you know, basically, Oh, I'm in this band Pantera. And they, they talked it out, but like dime bag literally waited in line to meet David Allen co for the first time. Like when he was famous dime bag. Yeah. Like, really? yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. Like it, while Pantera was a thing, yeah. Oh no, kid! I didn't know that. I never heard that story. That's that's crazy. I did, how did he not get recognized in line? Well, he might have, and maybe that's why yeah. the, the David Onco knew. Like he's like, wait a minute, you're somebody. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that. Like when you just know somebody's like, I feel like this guy's probably in a band or something. Sure. Yeah, my guy Neely has that happen to him all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Are you dogged about it? Like I feel like I feel like you're in a band or something, man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um not much of a big story here, but it's kind of cool that uh ex Slayer drummer Dave Lombardo announces the debut solo album, Rights of Percussion. Have you checked this out at all? No, I was not aware of this. Who's putting it out? Uh Ipecac. Oh, Patton's label? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the story is Dave Lombardo, one of the most influential, innovative, and prolific drummers of modern music, will release his debut solo album, Rights of Percussion, on May 5th through Ipecac Records. Uh, the 13-track collection previewed with today's release of Journey of the Host is the result of a 40-year career that saw Lombardo rise to prominence as a co-founder of Slayer earn two Grammy awards and uh, expand his repertoire across genres. The Cuban born Lombardo's resume includes outings with uh, acrobatic Mike Patton led Phantomas, the critically revered John Zorn experimental hip hop artist, DJ spooky and the resurrected punk icons, the misfits and Mr. Bungle too, isn't he? Isn't he a Bungle guy? I don't know. I don't think he was ever. In no, Bungle. I thought he was no. Bungle at the, with the, Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. The new, but like the new version of, yeah, him. the yes. new version. Yeah. He's like one of the guys, right? Yeah. Cause they're doing like the, uh, the, the early thrash stuff like him yeah. and Scotty in plus. Yeah. I saw that Mr. Bungle. I'm over here like, no, he's not Mr. Bungle. And I saw that show. So. <laughs> I was going to say, I thought, I, I thought he was in there. <laughs> Um, Mike Patton originally gave me the idea as far back as 1998, explains Lombardo. He introduced me to Tito Puente's top percussion album. I was okay. familiar with Tito and I was a bit shocked that Patton was so musically diverse and that he has surrounded himself with musicians of the same mindset. That inspired me. I have had, a, uh, I have had ideas that I've recorded on cassette over the years, but Patton kept insisting that I do a drum album. So the idea behind the album is years in the making. I just had to find the right time for me to do it. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. I just wanted to, do you think it's going to be good? Or do you think it'll suck? Because it'll be all uh, kind of weird. They've got the stuff. one track out now. And yeah, it's definitely like, uh, I mean, it's obviously just very drum heavy. It's not right. like a rock album at all. Um, but I mean, I'm I definitely, I love Dave Lombardo as a player. And uh, as a as a as an interview, great interview back in the day. And sure. So, uh, so yeah, I'll definitely be checking this out. And uh, were yeah. you ever into his band Grip Inc? Uh, I think you and I have talked about them in the past. I never really got into them. I, I was I was a big fan of that band. I love when he was out of Slayer that first time he left Slayer. Yeah. And he did that Grip Inc band. Wow, what a good record! The the one record was really good. Uh, Nemesis, I think it's called. You know, okay. I don't even remember now. So how good was it really? But, you know, um, I loved it at the time. I played the shit out of it. So 
I'm a huge fan. I, I love Lombardo. I think he's great. I think Slayer was never the same without him. Yeah. You know, it's one of the few times that I'll ever agree with people that the, that the, and you know, I'm a former drummer, bad one, but a former drummer. So <laughs> right. you would think I would have the drummers back, but rarely do I ever agree with drummers are not inner, like interchangeable. Most times I think they absolutely are. I mean, there's a few examples, I guess, that you could, like Steven Adler, I think has his, has a pretty unique drum sound, but you know, most drummers can be swapped out for anybody, I think, but Lombardo's one with Slayer, John Dett and, and, and who's the other guy that played with them? Bostoff. Bostoff. They sounded way more mechanical than, yeah. than um, Lombardo did. I would, I would have loved to have seen Hoagland in Slayer, but now that would have been good. I want to see Gene Hoagland in pretty much any band, though. <laughs> I want to see him in your band. <laughs> yeah, I'll take him right now. Um, uh, he goes on to say, when the pandemic hit, I thought, well, I can't tour now, he says. I immediately started working on the record. It was one of the greatest experiences I've ever had. I had my studio, all my drums. Nothing was in storage for once. My home became a place where I could be free and creative. On the other hand, the touring part of my livelihood had been taken away. But on the other hand, I finally had the time to educate my sh myself on different software and recording techniques. It was a very educational and gratifying experience. Mm -hmm. The recording process of the film score-like album had a simple mantra. Drums had to be drums. Mixed in early 2022 by Lombardo's son, David A. Lombardo, uh, the self-produced release features a large concert bass drum, a timpani, a grand piano, and a flock of shakers, maracas, Chinese, and symphonic gongs, Native American drums, congas, uh, timbales, uh, bongos, batas, woodblocks, ibos, oh my God. darbukas, octobans, uh, cajones, and cymbals. So there you go. That that sounds like a good album. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, uh, it sounds like know. one I will never listen to. This is going to be on the on the Chris Aiken sex playlist. <laughs> <laughs> this is not. This sounds awful. This <laughs> this sounds fucking terrible. This sounds this sounds like ugh, soundtrack to hell. Just a bunch yeah. of ding 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 ding. <laughs> <laughs> your lady's gonna come over and you're gonna hit play on the record player and she knows the night is gonna be a good night oh, she'll say zip that shit up you're not getting any of this with that <laughs> <laughs> no I, i'm excited to hear this man i'm uh well, like you I can say, tell me how it is once I you start tell you all about it once you start naming instruments that i've never even heard of that just tells me it's artsy fartsy and i want nothing to do with it Nah, it's gonna be awesome. Well, you're gonna be it. awesome. Um, let's see here. What else we got here? Not a lot of news this week, as, as you it's and really I talked not. about beforehand. Did, I don't know. It, it's a story out there somewhere. I'm sure it's probably on Blabbermouth. I, I don't remember where I read it, but did you hear the um, the dude from System of a Down's new music that he's that he's doing, like the real heavy record he's trying to do? Uh, um, I have not, I, yeah, I have not listened to it actually. Let me pull that up. I just saw it. Yeah, it's it's really good. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> and you know, I'm not a huge fan of System at all, but um, uh, I, I I don't know the story. I didn't even read the story. I just saw that there was music, so I checked it out, and I was like, "Damn, this sounds really fucking good." Uh, let's see here. System of a Down bassist Chavo, not going to attempt the last name, has confirmed that he's putting the finishing touches on his debut album. Uh, the 48-year-old Armenian-American musician born, I'm definitely not re reading that, uh, is working on the LP with Winds of Play guitarist Michael Montoya, a.k.a. Morgoth Beats, uh, a producer and songwriter who has previously collaborated with Travis Barker, Juice World, Jonathan Davis Issues, and many more. Uh, Shavo spoke about his plans for solo material while taking part in Jonathan Mon Montenegro's My Three Questions 2 series. Uh, he said, I've got a solo record coming out very soon. That's heavy and it's big. It's not hip hop. It's just crazy. All of my side projects have been kind of hip hoppy or electro. I wanted to do something that felt right to me from day one. That's my DNA. So look out for the solo record. 
and then there's there's like a sample or something in that and uh, yeah. man it is heavy okay i was i was like this is great i can't believe it <laughs> uh yeah then it just goes on to talk more about system of a down but yeah i i i'm definitely uh looking forward to especially if it's going to be heavy I, I love uh there's something about shavo that's always just been super cool and sure. kind of kind of seems like he's one of the unsung heroes of system of a yeah. down now now that he's gonna do a solo record are you gonna you gonna make the jump to try and get him on the show uh well as we were talking i was like what's my connection to shavo i think <laughs> I, th I think i can figure it out like uh yeah who who do we connect the dots with to make that happen <laughs> <laughs> right well, i already thought about the dave lombardo thing i gotta get him back sure. on the show too but uh but yeah so basically if you want to come on the talk to me podcast put out a solo album from here if you're in a big band yeah put out a solo album and I can, I'll interview you for that. That's right. <laughs> Have you been recently released from a band? Yeah. We're Come here to help. talk to me. Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Dial 1-800 talk to me. That's right. Tell me your story. <laughs> uh, Dude, speaking of bands that we both, I think like, okay. did you hear, since we're just rambling anyway, at this point, did you hear the new single from devil driver through the depths? Uh, no, I've seen the photos and stuff from that, but I have not listened to the song. Dude, that band could do no wrong for me. That's like probably as far as like the 2000s up Devil Driver Cataclysm are probably my one and two okay. fa favorite bands that have come out in that era. And Devil Driver just does no wrong. And man, this Through the Depths is awesome. I mean, awesome. <laughs> Just fan and, and it's like, isn't it? It's like a completely new band, I think, isn't it? Yeah, As everybody a, but uh, Mike Spritzer, Mike Spritzer, and obviously Dez. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. I mean, it's they they never miss a beat, and it's always great. So I'm 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 very pumped to get this record. I I don't know what the holdup's been. It's been done for years, I think, because it's <laughs> a part two of something, isn't it? A dealing with demons part two. Uh, as the world was upended in 2020, uh, California groove metalers, Devil Driver, didn't pause, releasing the acclaimed first installment of their two-part De Dealing with Demons saga, Dealing with Demons Part 1. Now, as society emerges more hardened and determined than before, so does Devil Driver's 10th full-length album, Dealing with Demons Volume 2. Ooh. So, once again, produced and engineered by Steve Evitz. I need to get him on the podcast uh, with additional, it? yeah, with additional addition, additional engineering from Mike Spritzer uh, dealing with demons. Volume two is inarguably heavier and relentlessly harsher than this prede predecessor. The new album represents not only the most vicious of the two records, but also the darkest recesses of celebrated front man's does Fafara's psyche and the final purging of his Jesus, demons that have long this? haunted the band's who wrote, music. <laughs> who wrote this drivel? Jesus Christ. Uh, it's probably wow. AI. It's probably <laughs> yeah, it might be. <laughs> <laughs> I you know what's funny is I interviewed the uh I interviewed Mark uh Heilman from Suicide Silence today, mm -hmm. and I almost like just to see when it, when it was about to go into the AI app and be like, give me 10 questions for Mark Heilman of suicide silence for their new album. Just to like, just see what just it see what out. comes up with. You should have try it. Yeah. I might do that the next time I do an interview just to see what the old AI has to say. Sure. I've done yeah. some like, not to get off on an AI tangent, but I've That's done okay. some like, I'm like, Hey, you know, give me a, a bio for the talk to me podcast featuring Joshua. And like, the AI will pull in like former primer 55 bass mm -hmm. player and you know, like, just like, I'm like, how do you know this AI get out of my brain? <laughs> Dude, I use AI now for all of the CMS, like um, paragraphs and stuff. And for, for YouTube and for the, all of the titles I yeah. have two, I, I've literally saved two little lines. One is give me an aggressive YouTube um, description, you know, that ends with a request to subscribe. And yeah. then the second one is give me an aggressive title under, under 85 characters, you know, and, and I tell it those two things and it, and it shits them out. And it's funny reading it now when it's funny, even more funny when it's wrong. Like, yeah. like I had one the other day that was just totally missed. And it was, 
I, I forget what, what I had told it, you know, as far as the content, but it was like, you're never going to believe this when Jarvis Leatherby of night demon says this. And I was like, he never said that, <laughs> but it just, <laughs> but it just kind of, yeah. you know, it, it's trying to be aggressive. And, and I, and I do love the fact that, you know, when you tell it to be aggressive, it comes back like, if you're listening to any other podcast, you're a fucking moron. You know, <laughs> right? it, it starts like really harsh. And I, and I use that all the time now. Cause it's just funny to me. It's funny. And I just put it, and I don't give a shit what the YouTube, nobody reads the YouTube descriptions anyway. So yeah. it's just funny. <laughs> We had a, um, a few weeks ago, I did a, I did an episode of Cobras and fire and Baca was like, give me like three fake ads, you know, and we were going to do them mm -hmm. like Chris Jericho does them like, and speaking of AI, sure. You know, blah, 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 blah. You know, what's funny about AI is, you know, golf t-shirts or something. And so I was like, I, I, I had asked, uh, the, the AI to write a parody, uh, comedic, sketch for uh, uh like a hemorrhoid cream sure and it came back with medical conditions aren't funny <laughs> oh. <laughs> like, it did one of those things i was like all right all right chat ai you know <laughs> get over yourself hemorrhoid cream jokes are funny yeah they're yeah funny. it's just funny we, uh, dealing with medical issues is not a funny th topic to be making fun of yeah but but you know what a lot of times you could say oh you did it before and it'll do it yeah i've heard that so maybe i'll do that next time but yeah, that was that was a fun episode. Go check that episode out. I had some pretty funny. I actually came up with a uh um because Baco, those guys always make fun of uh people like Kiss Cruise and things like that, people just tucking in their band t-shirts into their sure. jorts. So I was like, write me a skit for tucked in t-shirts. <laughs> nice. So it was a, it was a fun one. Go check that out. Corpus of Fire is a pretty good weekly listen. You should you should make yeah. time for that every week. <laughs> um, speaking of Jeff Scott Soto from earlier, um, so the question is, did Dave Mustaine overreact when he fired Dave Ellison from Megadeth? The Jeff answer, Scott Soto yes. weighs in. <laughs> the answer, yes. Uh, in a new YouTube, in a new interview with the YouTube channel of the Brazilian music journalist Igor Miranda, Acclaimed hard rock singer Jeff Scott Soto was asked if he thinks that Dave Mustaine overreacted when he fired Dave Ellison from Megadeth in May of 2021, just days after sexually tinged messages and explicit video footage involving the bassist were posted on Twitter. Okay. Soto, who is involved with Ellison in a project called Ellison Soto, mm -hmm. responded, My personal opinion? I don't like to get into replying for someone else, uh, somebody else in those kind of things, because there's so many sites out there that will watch what we're talking about here and make a headline out of it, <laughs> which they did. <laughs> but my personal opinion is I think there are, there was already trouble in the water. I think there was already something happening and maybe he was looking for a reason or an excuse to end it. And that's just my own personal feeling, but without getting too into it because I don't want to be in the headlines. Jeff Scott Soto blasts Dave Mustaine. Oh, that's what he said the headline was going to be. Yeah. Jeff Scott Soto blasts Dave Mustaine. I don't want any of that type of shit in my life. It's not necessary, so I'm going to leave it at I think there was already something for years that was he was looking for a reason to move on and use that one. Uh, that's pretty much it, I think, anyway, and that's what I'm assuming. No, he's not wrong. That, that's yeah. that's a hundred percent true. I he definitely look. I'll, I'll say it just from the stuff that I've heard back ended, and since most of it came from Bob Nelbandian, who's no longer here to be yelled at, I guess I can say it. <laughs> you know, uh, it it was it was a lot of problems with Ellison having all the side projects and having the coffee company and the different bands and and um and there was some issues that I've heard. That Mustaine didn't like him having having um, not necessarily Tom Hazart specifically, but anybody going out singing Megadeth tunes. Yeah, he didn't like that. He he was like Megadeth is Megadeth. You're diluting the brand. That's what I heard, you know. But even that being said, you still unceremoniously booted the guy out, you know, when he needed a 35 year, 40 year friend to stand by his side. And Mustaine should never be forgiven for that. 
because that's just a fucking cowardly way to do things. Sorry if that offends people, but that's just the truth. Stand by him and have a private conversation, not publicly fire him and distance yourself and black screen with Megadeth has agreed to part ways. Fuck you. You know, <laughs> have have some fucking stones to stand by your guy that you yeah. literally have your whole career in large part with. Yeah, I mean, it's tough, and I obviously don't know the financials of it, but I mean, with with Megadeth, with Dave, with Dave Ellison re-entering the Megadeth camp, he came back in as kind of a hired gun, mm-hmm. and so he probably wasn't making you know money off of the T-shirts and everything else, oh. so he goes out there and he does the coffee company, and he does the, uh, you know, writing books and things like that. He mm-hmm. also does the, the Ellison solo record and the covers record, and you know, going out there and playing shows with Tom singing the Megadeth songs, like you said, and yeah. and things like that. So, I mean, like you kind of got to make your ends meet, man. You got to, well, you know, your, your you ends aren't to. meeting when you're not on tour and there's yeah. no money coming in. And, and I, and again, I don't know this to be true that now I am going to start talking out my ass a little, because this is not <laughs> something that now Bandian or anybody else told me, but I will assume that a big part of Dave's, you know, problem, Dave Mustaine's problem was not so much that Elfson was doing a lot of this stuff. I mean, I'm sure he didn't like it, but I'm sure it wasn't that big of a deal. I'm sure a part of it had more to do with, he felt like he was prostituting the name Megadeth for yeah. his own means. You know, the, the book was what no life after or more life after death and no life yeah. after death with D E T H. And the, the biggest coffee brand is, um, Roast in, Ro- peace. roast in peace. And, you know, so he was using Megadeth without using Megadeth. And the Ellison you, logo was basically the Megadeth logo. Right. And, and the all the coffees and things like that had kind of that, uh, what is it, the Hangar 18 looking mm-hmm. logos on them and things like that. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, he I mean, I, I certainly see that Mustaine may have been angry about some of that stuff. But again, was it to the level if he had said, don't do it. And he kept doing it. Well, then he should have fired him for doing it. Right. If he was a hired gun, you know, the the problem, I mean, look, we all know what the real deal was. He didn't want to deal with the fucking hassle of back and his friend. That's what the, that's what the deal was is, is hard to, especially when at the time, and we got to remember at the time, nobody knew how old the girl was. Yeah. Nobody knew if the girl was 13 or 19, you know, and, and because of that, instead of waiting to see what happened, Ellison just put distance before he needed to and, and walked away from it because he probably had a case that he asked about all the other stuff. And then he started thinking about, and that motherfucker sued me too, son of a bitch. <laughs> you right. know, he probably, that probably crept back up in his head as well. I mean, I get it. I, I personally do think now the same as I thought with the day it happened, that it was a, that it was kind of a bitch move. and. You know, I, I would stand by my friends personally until I had full, until I couldn't stand by him anymore. You know, if, if eventually it would have worked out that Ellison was, you know, grooming a nine-year-old or something, then right. yeah, then I would have been like, all right, I got to walk away from this friend or not. I got to, I got to pull back. But <laughs> when it was just a, when it was a rumor and Ellison wasn't arrested and there was investigations spurned by Ellison into it. I yeah. think I might've stood by my buddy to at least see how it played out. Yeah, I definitely, definitely agree on all that, man. He's uh, yeah. If it would have been like a nine year old, I'm like, ah, you, your bass playing on, on rust and peace was great and all, but I, I gotta, I gotta walk away from this one. Yeah. Well, and I mean, look, I mean, we have other examples where the, you know, like Dave Holland from Judas priest. Yeah. He's in the fucking rock and roll hall of fame. And what did he do? He like had, he had like raped a, a, like a mentally challenged kid. kid or something. Yeah. You know? Um, so, you know, I mean, he's in the rock and roll hall of fame. He's still getting accolades. So, you know, where's that line? Right. Jerking off is more of a crime than that. I don't think so. Well, there's no video of the, uh, you know, molesting a handicapped yeah. kid. Yeah, there's not, <laughs> yeah. I, I guess. But still, jerking off. So what if there's a video of it? 
I mean, it's yeah. just a bad look. It's just a bad look, <laughs> figuratively, <laughs> literally. But yeah, you know, it's not. Again, it's not a crime. Who hasn't jerked off on FaceTime for God's sakes? Well, I don't think I've ever have, but never on FaceTime. No, on Duo. <laughs> <laughs> on Streamyard, no. Streamyard, yeah, <laughs> uh, Skype. Uh, you know, no, I don't think my only fans pretty, cam, no. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. If you want to see me jerk off, it's going to cost you four ninety nine right. a month. That's right. Um, <laughs> well, let's dive into some uh, reviews, recommendations, and we'll start with the uh, the new Chris Rock special. Um, okay. Uh, what is it called? Do you know the name of it off the top? Of your um. Head? Because I do not, and I should. I forget this. what it's called. It's you talk about it for a second. I'll find it. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I don't remember what it's called. Honestly, I mean, it was good. I know that it, it's. Um, I enjoyed it. I I think selective I think outrage. Selective outrage. Yeah, I think. But this is my two second assumption. I personally, as somebody that really doesn't give a fuck what anybody thinks about yeah. my politics or my thoughts or whatever, I loved it. I thought it was yeah. really funny. I even the stuff that I don't agree with him in politically, I still thought was pretty funny, you know? So I, I thought it was really, really good. I understand why it's polarizing because yeah. anybody that's not right wing, anybody that's not hardcore one side or the other right wing or left wing was probably offended at some part of it to where they're like, fuck this guy. He's an asshole. Right. You know, but, but for me, who just doesn't give a shit about anybody else, I just watched it and laughed. I thought he was hilariously insightful on a lot of stuff personally. And I love the Will Smith smashing. That was fantastic. Yeah. I like when he's like, I love this guy's music, you know, summertime. And he's like going on and on about him. Yeah. And then, um, I, you, you, we had texted a little bit during the beginning of it because I was like, Jesus Christ, this guy is basically just up here being Chris Aiken rock. Yeah. And, you know, basically things I've heard you say a million times. He's up there, like, like when he's talking about the Lululemon, you know, where they have a sign on the front that say, we don't tolerate, you know, racism and right, right, right. homophobia and all this stuff. And he's like, who gives a shit? Like, all of them, <laughs> you sell sweatpants. Like, you know, like, why should, why do I care about your politics? You know, I just mm -hmm. need to know how you're, how you handle ball sweat or something like yeah. that. Like it was, it's just, it, it's like, yeah. I mean, why would I care about Lululemon telling me that they're anti-racism? Like, yeah. You should like, aren't, isn't everybody yeah, like, every anti-racism? <laughs> isn't that like the, you know, I mean, I guess if it, it would be a, a sign, if you said like, you know, we are all about racism and yeah, homophobia, exactly. come on in, you know, like, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's like that whole, yeah. like, I say, and, and then an old Chris rock joke. And he's just like, He's like, I take care of my kids. He's like, you're supposed to take care of your kids or whatever. <laughs> you know, he's like, I have been in jail. You're not supposed to be in jail. Right? Like, that's kind of the thing. It's like, it's like, yeah, you're you're not supposed to be for racism. Like, why do I care about Lou Lemon? Right. I, I know the one part, and, and I'm going to preface this before the, the trolls on YouTube get to me. I know Chris Rock was not listening to the classic metal show and yeah. stole a bit from me. But I ain't gonna lie. If when he started saying about killing babies, yeah, and being pro killing babies, I have been saying that in those terms have. since I came back to the classic metal show in 2012. Yeah. I've been saying that exact. And when I heard it, I was like, "Holy shit, that's my <laughs> fucking thing." Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know it, it's not a new thing. You can find ten years of me saying that on YouTube. I just yeah. that one bit really kind of caught me off guard. <laughs> I think that's what when I when I texted you, I was like, "Man, he's Chris Aiken Rockabilly because he talks about." It. And he goes, "And don't get it twisted because you are killing a baby." And I'm mm -hmm. like, "God, that is Chris Aiken a hundred percent." I know. I was like, "Well, I'm glad somebody else feels the same way I do." That <laughs> trying to change the word to soften what you're doing is lame. And that's basically what he was saying. Yeah. I, um, I appreciate that. It, I, I guess it went out live. I didn't realize mm -hmm. it was a live taping. Um, I do like that part of it, but I, he did flub a couple of jokes and I, 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 I kind of wish it would have maybe been edited later or something. Yeah. Because he, and, he flubbed, and, and, he flubbed a, like he flubbed a punchline at the end. Like, or he said the wrong word and had to sure. like restart. And I'm like, what is going on here? Right. And, and they could have also edited that first 45 minutes out. 
the when you go to Netflix, and maybe they have now, but when I watched it, it had like 10 minutes to the first it had a 10 minute countdown of just countdown, just yeah. music and a countdown. And then they went into that whole preamble thing with Dana Carvey and um Yeah, no, I, by the time I watched it, they didn't have that. Oh, okay. Was, when I watched it, the, I watched it like the next morning that it okay. was on and they had the whole thing. And I was like, Ugh, this is a lot of fast forwarding to get to what I want to see. The, uh, I mean, I guess it, it kind of, is that one of the first live things that Netflix has done? The kinda, first live thing they've done. So, I mean, they're kind of dipping their toe into like actual live broadcasts. I wonder how many people, other comics are going to basically do their live stand up that way. I think it was, I think I was listening to Bill Burr talking about how he, he appreciated that, that Chris Rock did it live. And he goes, man, that he doesn't have to sit through all the edits and all the, you know, mm-hmm. you say the, this word this way on this, on this uh, hour special and this hour special, and you know, where they're, they do the back-to-back specials in the one night and they edit them together to make one good thing. And sure. He's like, he's like, man, he just went up there and did it and it's out. It's over. Like, yeah, I kind of, kind of appreciate that. Yeah. But like you said, but now it's, it's warts and all. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit torn with, um, with it being live, live. I mean, I, I love comedy shows. I go to comedy shows a lot. Yeah. I, I really enjoy seeing it live because a lot of times when something fucks up, then they play even better off of the fuck up yeah. in that scenario where he's probably got it timed to the minute that he's allowed to do. You know, he can't really react and be like, oh, I blew that one. Let's try that again. Or, you know, right. You know, he can't, he can't be real with it. And that's, that's not good. And who knows for all we know, Netflix in the future might do a dry run with no audience of the whole set once through so that they have something to edit in if they need to. Right. You know, you know, I mean, how hard would it be when he flubbed that line to go to an old video of him doing the same line, edit it in on a close shot where you don't see the audience. And then you just play the audience track under it laughing and people would never know the difference. Yeah. There were a few times where he, he threw in little lines at the end of jokes that, that if I was editing, I would have chopped those out and stuff. Sure. Like he, he, he got the laugh and then he wanted to maybe a little bit more laugh, mm-hmm. but, but as for Chris rock specials, but I thought it was great. I thought it was a little long. I didn't. Yeah. When he, when he saw it might be a rich, I was like, all right, I guess like talking about taking his kids to Disney and, and you know, cause he's the way he takes them to Disney now. Cause he's rich. And right. I'm, I'm like, all right, I don't know if I'm really relating to this one. Chris rock. Yeah. Well, you know, just, I got you. cause we're not rich. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It's just a little, little bit out there, but yeah, that first, first about 20 minutes of the Chris rock special is, is classic. It's great. Show. Yeah. Really good. stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> too funny but yeah that that was a good one man i enjoyed it so um the, this episode goes up on thursday on friday the new suicide silence album comes out it's called a remember you must die okay <laughs> so uh i i've i've been listening to this album uh, pretty much non-stop the last two days and it's got some of the heaviest guitars on it like uh, you know, they 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 have the blast beats, but then they drop it down and just you know they do the the classic like we're gonna play the riff and then we're gonna play the riff but play it slower and right. every time it gets me and I was just like oh this is what I'm this is what I'm here for nice nice well, I can't wait to, I've not heard that album I somehow that did not venture into my into my um, email box somehow which is surprising I usually get all that stuff but I did not get that one. But I will be listening because I'm a fan of the band, so I like them. So very cool. So, yeah. So uh, so yeah. Make sure to uh, I, I do recommend the new Suicide Silence, and I do recommend the Chris Rock special. What do you got going on? Um, TV wise, um, the newest season of The Mayor of Kingstown on uh, Paramount, I think, is okay. fantastic. It's a great, great show. It's with um, that dude that got hit by the snowplow. Um, a couple months back that Jeremy (laughs) Renner guy. Yeah. Okay. Great, great show. It's kind of like a prison drama type of a show. Real gritty, real raw, really, really good. This season's been great. Same with uh, uh, your honor is now finishing up the new season of your honor, which is Brian Cranston's thing. That's been really, really good. So those would be the TV things. Um, 
a shameless plug for me for one of my okay. things um because i think it'll play to this audience um for those that like the music that we generally talk about and specifically the interviews that you generally do i'm going to be interviewing um buzz and trevor from unearth on monday oh, nice. live on uh chris aiken presents so if people want to oh, awesome. check that out uh chris aiken.net monday 8 p.m eastern time and get in on it if you have questions for the guys from unearth their album is fucking kick-ass have you heard that yet the wretched the ruinous I've listened to one. I think I heard one track off of it on like Sirius XM. Really strong, man. They're they're. I mean, they sound like they always sounded, but I always thought they were great. So, yeah. I mean, when that when the oncoming storm came out, like I remember, like there was them and like Killswitch Engage and a couple mm-hmm. of other bands that like that that like truly were doing something different at the time. Like sure, we were, we were all new metal, all. Olympus get in Deftones and Corn, and then all of a sudden the un- like I I just remember the opening riff to uh, the oncoming storm and just being like oh sure. shit <laughs> yeah there was just a there was so many good bands all at the same time there was them Shadows Fall I think came out right about the same time yeah. God forbid was hitting at the same time just a lot of great bands right in that exact moment in time so good stuff just funny quick story about unearth yeah we we brought them in to when i was on um the metal show on um 92.3 here in cleveland uh we brought them in we used to do these extreme sessions we did them with a bunch of bands fear factory chimera uh machine head um you know we and we bring them in and we'd invite like 10 fans it was a real exclusive thing and we would do it at a studio at like two in the afternoon so we brought in unearth at one point to do because we played the shit out of unearth and um, we always gave them what we always called a mini rider, which was we would tell them we 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 could get like a hundred bucks from the radio station. So we would do a mini rider of you know, you guys are coming into town, you're coming in early for lunch. Basically, we'll go get you a rotisserie chicken and a case <laughs> of beer is basically yeah. what we were looking at, right? So we gave the mini rider to request to Trevor, and we said, hey, just tell us what you want. He comes back with, I want three bottles of Jack Daniels. And I was like, okay, do you want any food? Nope. Three (laughs) bottles of Jack Daniels. Yeah. So we get him his three bottles of Jack Daniels. The, we do the thing at like two o'clock in the afternoon on a night that they, that they have a show. They come in, we give first thing Trevor's like, Hey, you got that Jack Daniels? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give him the Jack Daniels. He goes and he sits with the 10 fans that were on a floor. They're all just sitting like Indian style on the floor, passing around the bottles of Jack Daniels. And he got the whole crowd, the whole little crowd <laughs> all hammered, drinking, drinking dead pulls straight from the straight from the bottle, which was it was one of the most fun moments just seeing this band totally not being douchey band guys that separated themselves from the little crowd he just was like hey come on over guys you want a drink and everybody was just <laughs> passing the bottle fun time good stuff yeah the the only time i remember doing something like that was uh was uh kyle gas from tenacious d mm-hmm. he had a he had a band called train wreck okay and they were they were touring and uh, I was standing out out back of the the exit in in Nashville where they had just played, and he was he him and like a couple of other dudes and like a friend of mine and me were all standing there. And we were passing around a bottle of Jaeger, oh, <laughs> just like just just the thought of Jaegermeister now is just like <laughs> oh, yeah, no more of that, huh? I still drink was, it every now and again, but not as often as I used to. Ooh. Yeah, I just uh, the last like the 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 big primer tour we did was was dope and primer. And uh, it was sponsored by Jaeger. So oh, everybody man. like that was a fan of the band would come up and be like, I got you guys shots of Jaeger. Like thinking that like we all were drinking Jaeger because the, right? the tour was sponsored by Jaeger. I'm like, no, thank you. <laughs> 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 but I'll drink it anyway, you know. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. And then I think uh, just one last quick um, recommendation. There's a band out there called To The Grave. Have you heard this band? Mm-mm. If no, I have not, if a muir okay got kicked in the nuts once a minute for, um, I don't know, ten hours, and okay. then recorded an album, this is that album. 
<clears throat> it sounds just like it to me. It sounds very much like a Muir, but just super, super fucking pissed off. Not that they're not super pissed <laughs> right. off. They're even but more pissed off. It's to that level of more pissed off. So, so great band. Um, the, the album is called director's cut and my God, you will come out and listen to that thing tired. It just wears you out. It's so heavy. So check that one out to the grave. Nice. Well, I think this episode is going to the grave. That's right. With my fucking shoulder. <laughs> all right. Well, that will do it for another episode of talk to me here. Not fest.com. Make sure you do all the fun things. You can follow the show at talk to me, talk on Twitter at talk to me, talk on Facebook. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Joshua dot to me. Chris Aiken is uh, what are you CMS like? CMS, 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 CMS something or other. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Chris Aiken dot net. It's all there. Go find all the good stuff and uh, make sure you rate, review, subscribe, tell your friend and tell your buddies, bring a friend and uh, we will talk to you guys uh, next Thursday. So yeah, for the talk to me podcast, I've been Joshua Toomey. I am Chris Egan and we will talk to you soon. See ya.